to not have me follow you. Hallelujah. Let's give Jesus praise in this house. Oh, come on. We can do way better than that. Let's give Jesus some praise in this place. Anybody know that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords? So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, don't act all funny in a ballroom. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, what an honor and what a joy it is to be uh, with really the champions uh, of the faith. Uh, there are many people around the world who uh, understand the Bible, read the Bible, study it, uh, and uh, very few that actually do it. And so you all represent those who have not uh, chosen to be mere hearers of the word, but doers. And, uh, and I am humble beyond uh, belief to stand in the company of those of you uh, who consistently pour your lives out uh, for the cause of the least of these. And to Dr. Perkins and to uh, so many other of the leaders uh, that are here that are the forerunners and um, trailblazers in this movement, uh, to God be the glory. So let's just give God praise for all of us who are making a difference in the lives of people who need it the most. Um, for those of you who uh, have any kind of sleep disorders, and, and you know, for some of you, you know, you know it's a challenge. Uh, for some of you that have may, may have eaten dinner and, uh, you know, your eyes uh, uh, kind of begin to desire to connect sooner than they should, you know, the lids. Uh, I promise that this will not happen uh, in the next few moments. I am going to be your espresso uh, coffee black with no cream and no sugar. Uh, so just tell the person next to you, we got some coffee in the house. Tell the person on the other side, you ain't going to sleep. Tell them you're not going to sleep. Amen. Let's, 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 let's pray. Let's pray together and just settle our hearts and focus on the word. Father, we love you, and we give you glory and praise for this moment. I wonder how many of us, God, realize when we touch history, as we desire, Lord God, to, um, to honor you and to please you and serve you, so many of us live in the uh, past or in the future, but very few of us can enjoy the present. So help us, God, in this moment, even in this time, to simply say thank you for that that you have done and that that you will do, but most importantly, for that that you're doing even now. We thank you for your word because your word is a lamp unto our feet and your word does not return unto you empty, God. It is your word that brings life to us. So would you allow your word to do what it always does, which is to speak to us in ways that go far beyond what uh, natural uh, things could ever do. It, it is life-giving. So let your word do what it always does tonight as our prayer. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And every believer that believed it said amen and amen. Uh, I just want to share with you all uh, from the book of Philippians chapter 4. Uh, beginning at verse 4, Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a preacher, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm just going to preach. Um, and so uh, uh, Philippians 4, beginning at verse 4. I bring you uh, greetings from Detroit, Michigan. <clears throat> Detroit in the house. And um, uh, I was born and raised in Chicago, and seven years ago, uh, I left this great city to go to a greater city. Um, I know. Oh, whatever. Get over it. Didn't you hear the Trinity is in Detroit, the big three? <laughs> anyway. Um, and so it has been an honor uh, uh, to see what God has uh, been doing as we have started to do some ministry there. And uh, I'll, I'll share with you in a little moment how uh, God is moving. But uh, Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. 
And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, uh, brothers, whatever is true and whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Verse 9 again. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I want you to turn to the person uh, sitting next to you and help me announce the subject tonight, if you would, if you don't mind. And I know some of you all may not know the person next to you, so uh, get to know them as you do it. But, but you're going to turn to the right or the left. And every time I do this, uh, there's always a challenge in the room because some of you all, uh, you know, you're so smart. And, and so some of you are saying, well, what if I turn in that direction? And, and what if they turn in the same direction? Uh, then I'm talking to the back of their head. Just obey God and your life will be blessed, all right? <laughs> Decide which way you'll turn and, and turn to your neighbor and say to your neighbor, neighbor, some of y'all still didn't do it, all right? Turn to a person on either side and repeat the words coming out of my mouth. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, have you learned how to rejoice in the present? Look at the other person on the other side and say, hey, you, you look like you've learned how to rejoice in the present. Give yourselves a hand. Move to the head of the class. Rejoicing in the present. You all, most of us uh, really live in two spaces. We either live in the past or we long for the future. Most of us always refer back to those special moments in our lives that were significant, that held some kind of incredible memory that sometimes gives us fuel, uh, even in the present. But most of us kind of reminisce back on the good old days, and that usually is our point of reference that brings us even present joy, what happened in the past. Nothing wrong with doing that. It's very good and very significant to remember. As a matter of fact, the scripture is incredibly uh, full of examples of remembrance. There were stones of remembrance that were set up to remember how God brought the children of God across uh, incredible and insurmountable difficulties. There were times that the Lord tells us that the children of Israel would gather around the table and the children would say to the uh, mom or dad, what do these things mean? What do these herbs mean? And what does this bring? bread that does not have yeast mean and they would remember how God had br had brought them out of uh, Egypt nothing wrong with remembering some of you all remember some things remember when you first fell in love some of y'all kind of hesitated and didn't remember yeah but remember when you first started dating and you all uh, uh, started figuring out what are we gonna wear tomorrow and you decided to wear the same clothes remember that and you remember you all used to walk on the same step what about some of y'all okay y'all never been in love that's all right God is good and uh, we're praying your strength Remember when you first had your baby, that little bundle of joy? Remember they first came out and you looked at their feet and looked at their hands and made sure that everything was in place? And I mean, just remembering those days sometimes brings you unbelievable joy. When you first learned how to ride a bike, when you first graduated from grammar school or maybe even high school, memories are significant. However, you all, God does not call us to always live in the past because we're not in the past. Many of us often find encouragement about the future. And so some of us say, well, you know what? When I get married, I'll be happy. <laughs> Y'all are a crazy group of people up in this room, and I love it. I ain't kidding. I mean, I've never heard this kind of response in a, in a crowd. Uh, Y'all are some special people. Tell the person next to you, you are very special. That might not be a compliment, but we're, that's all right. All right. 
Listen, you all, many people find their excitement uh, kind of connected to the future, that when I get the new house or when God moves in my ministry and when I finally get into the place where I feel that development is really occurring in the way that God wants it, then I'll be happy. But if the truth be told, you all, we cannot attach rejoicing uh, strictly to what is yet to be because it's not here yet. But if we could ever learn to rejoice in the present if we could ever learn that if things never get better and if I don't ever relive what happened in the past God has been good today and so if you all don't mind in these next few moments I want to celebrate what the CCDA has already done what it's going to do but right now rejoice in the present for what God is doing right now God is doing some awesome stuff in the earth right now now listen, some of you all, I, I, I know this, and it's so great to have a diverse group of people. Our congregation is a multicultural uh, congregation, and if anybody's ever been to Detroit, Detroit for the most part is an African-American city, and so uh, leaving from Chicago, uh, and by the way, I'm black. I just thought I'd, I'd let you know because maybe I, you, you may not know that, and it's very significant. And I've been black as long as I can remember. Uh, I, I mean, I cannot remember a time uh, I've not been black. And so when I left Chicago and went to Detroit, black preacher plus black city equals black church. That's what I thought. God's ways are not our ways, and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. I don't know where these white people <laughs> came from. And you know, most people that claim multicultural churches, they mean they got two people, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's really what they really mean. Yeah, you know, uh, we have a multicultural ministry. Uh, yeah, just one person and they, and they kid. All right. I'm talking about they were coming in droves. And I'm like, where y'all coming from? And so what God has kind of done is shown me the incredible uh, sense of humor that God has when it comes to ministry. Because sometimes we will think that God wants to move in one direction, but he'll move in another. Sometimes we'll plan for God to operate one way, but he'll operate another way. And the joy of it all is that God is going to get glory because all of this is about him. And it is not up to us to decide how we want him to move and when we want him to move and the way we want him to move but he'll move the way he wants to move when he wants to move and how he wants to move and I'm just wondering is there anybody in the place today that sees God moving in your life well if you don't mind if you don't mind and I know some of y'all culturally may not do this this may not be the way you want to move but if you don't mind if you're grateful for how good God has been to you if you don't mind giving God a praise why don't you open your mouth in this ballroom and say thank you for being a good God would you give him praise for giving you the opportunity in this hour to serve him what a joy what a joy you all it is vital it is essential to learn how to rejoice in the present because when we don't, the enemy will steal the very gift that God has given to us, which is the gift of his presence and his smile upon us saying, well done. In the book of Philippians, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi and really thanking them for an incredible uh, generosity that they have shown to him as he uh, was involved in ministry. And you all, whenever you're involved in any kind of ministry, it's always good when others support you. And so he penned this letter to the church at Philippi really to say, hey, you know what? In the midst of my journeys and in the midst of what God has called me to do, uh, a few people have really gone above and beyond to, to assist. And you all have been uh, some of those people. Thank you. But also in this letter, he also kind of ends the letter with some words of wisdom and encouragement. And he says in this uh, chapter, which is uh, echoing through history to us, he says, now rejoice in the Lord always. And he said, in case you didn't get the, the text message the first time, I will say it again. Rejoice. 
You all, I believe that it is, the, listen, it is, it, is the, it is the gift of God to have a spirit of rejoicing. You know, the saddest thing is to meet a Christian who is boring. I mean, I think it's downright sinful. Follow me as I follow Christ. It is with great joy that I serve the community. Um, the Lord has called me here to deal with uh, you people. And by God's grace and with great joy. Who listen, have you ever seen have you ever seen someone on their way to hell with excitement? Have you ever seen a have you ever seen an alcoholic on his way to hell with gusto? Have you ever, I mean, have you seen people that you knew were far from God and knew they were on their way to hell, but were actually passionate about going to hell? But then those of us whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, those of us that possess the very nature of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we have sometimes the unbelievable issue of not learning how to enjoy the present. And so for some of you all that are so ministry-minded that you can't have joy, baby, I came to give you a joy transplant. You cannot give something that you ain't got. I don't care what school you've been to. I don't care how many magazines you've read. I don't care how many conferences you've attended or binders on the shelf. If you do not possess the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, you can't give it to nobody if you ain't got it yourself. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Is there anybody here that has the joy May not have no money, but you got some joy. May not have a lot of friends, but you got some joy. May not have colleagues, but you got some joy. Is there anybody here that got some joy? I've been to cemetery, I mean seminary. And I can give you three points and a poem. And I can unpack the theological implications behind the book of Philippians and how it, I can do that. But that's not the assignment I was given. I was told tonight to remind the people to rejoice in the present. And I just came to say you all in a time where folk are talking about what they want to do, I thank God that CCDA is doing what God said to do. While other folk are speculating and postulating about what could be and having, do you know how many meetings we got? Do you know how many meetings people have? And then after the meeting, there are meetings about the meeting. And after all of that, nothing is ever really done. But I thank God from rural communities to urban centers, to universities and to places where young minds are being molded. All across this nation because of the vision and dream of a few people that said, what would it look like for the body of Christ to, to actually choose to not just talk about transformation, but actually embody transformation and to take our lives and insert it into the lives of others to live among people, to, to respect the people that God has called us to serve. And then in doing that, to see transformation like nothing else. And so you all, we need to rejoice in the moment of what God is doing. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. When I moved to Detroit, Michigan, uh, it was no cause for rejoicing because the opposition was unbelievable. Detroit is an incredibly impoverished city. To be a major metropolitan city, uh, if you get into the 
uh, the innards of the city of Detroit and get under the hood of it, you will find corruption. You will find unbelievable systemic injustice. And it's amazing to me that uh, George Barna re reported that uh, per capita, Detroit, Michigan has more churches per resident than any other city in America. So it's amazing to me that for a city to have more churches present and have the greatest levels of poverty and the greatest levels of crime, something is incredibly wrong with that picture. Because if we are indeed the salt and light of the world, then how can we claim to have more light in a city and then more darkness in that same city? Maybe it's that some folk who claim that they are the light are actually not being that light. And so you all, when I went to Detroit, Michigan, and, and our church began to uh, kind of grow, and it began to grow in this very unexpected way of being multicultural, uh, I, I ended up meeting with uh, nine African-American pastors. And it was one of the most incredible meetings for me because all the support I was getting was from white folk and white churches. So I was grateful to finally meet some black preachers. And so I put on my Baptist suit. You know, you got to have on a Baptist suit to meet with the preachers. And so I got me a big old uh, Bible. I mean, a big, you know, Thompson chain. I had to, had to look the part. And so I met with these pastors. And before I sat down, they said, I never get the oldest one. He said, uh, Reverend, Reverend Carey? I said, yes, sir. He said, just want to make sure you know that all of us have already met and we're all in agreement with what we're getting ready to say to you. I said, man, God bless you. Uh, thank you, sir. And I sat down, just excited, finally, some black pastors. And they said, we understand you got white people at your church. I said, yeah, yeah, the Lord has really kind of done some things pretty amazing. I mean, I didn't know they were here, but, uh, <laughs> but they, 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 they're, they're coming to the church, and yeah, God is doing that. They said, yeah, we, we, we know about that. We, we heard about that. And, um, you know, the last thing Detroit needs is an Uncle Tom like you bringing white people back. So what well, all nine churches, all nine of us have agreed to do is that we're going to pool our resources together to make sure that we close your church. <laughs> Welcome to Detroit. <laughs> and so as I sat there in utter disbelief that nine churches, light of the world, salt of the earth, decided to take their salt and light and collectively pool them together, to shut another church down. And that reminded me in that moment that even though there are many Christians, both in the church world or in the uh, community development or nonprofit world, that not everybody that claims Christ is in Christ. But there are some people who have chosen to be talked about and ridiculed and maybe even family members have isolated you. But it doesn't matter whether or not folk like you or not. You're not in this because of what man has said to you. But you heard a call from the Lord and you accepted the call from God. And I came to remind you, even though it's lonely, even though it's difficult, rejoice. Rejoice anyhow. Throw your head back and get a little swagger to your walk and rejoice anyway. All right. Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. He said, as you rejoice in the present Make sure that you don't let the rejoicing become an end. Don't build a monument around the rejoicing. Realize that there still is work to be done. And so let your gentleness be evident. As an African-American uh, growing up on the south side of Chicago with a single parent mom who raised me and really designed systemically to be a statistic, but for God to have intervened in a way that is amazing. Ended up going to St. Ignatius College Prep, a Jesuit prep school here in the city. And first time I had actually physically met white people at that school. 
because prior to that, it was just the Waltons and Eight is Enough and the Brady Bunch. And I assume all white families had big families. I just... <laughs> it's true. I mean, all of them had John Boy, Mary Ellen, uh, uh, Bobby and Cindy. I mean, it was just a whole bunch of them. And, and, and you know, yeah. And so I went to high school and... And it was in high school that I learned about the inequities that exist. Because you don't know what you don't have till you see what somebody else got the same age. It amazed me that as hard as I studied and as much as I matriculated like other students, and they would roll up to Ignatius in their own Mercedes as I traveled on the bus from the south side, barely able to scrape up enough for the bus fare. That there were incredible differences in the world. And I started realizing, you all, that even as I became a pastor and began to encounter various Christians, that some of them, even in their best intention, did not minister with gentleness. Did not minister with an understanding of this biblical mandate that when you rejoice in the Lord and realize how good he's been, let your gentleness be evident to everybody. That when you serve the least of these... You serve them with gentleness. You serve them with respect. You serve them with honor, knowing that you're not doing it in the name of the Lord. You're doing it to the Lord. We're not coming in his name only. But he said, what you've done to the least of them, you've done that to me. What would happen if the Jesus that you're going in the name of would become the Jesus that you're actually serving? What would happen? That little boy that is uneducated and dirty was Jesus. You know how you worship and you cry when you think about Jesus? I wonder as opposed to feeling as though I'm helping him, you realize that Jesus is changing me. And it's with humility and with gratitude and with gentleness that I approach this incredible grace God has given me. So he says, do this because the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, (laughs) but in every, I'm almost finished, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He said, don't be anxious about anything. How can we rejoice in the present? How can we look at the incredible time that God has allowed uh, this movement to be in America and in the world? How can we rejoice in it? But how can we choose to not be anxious? We can choose to not be anxious by realizing this is not about us. This is about God and about his mission and his mandate. And if he called you, he will supply every need you could ever think of having because this is his work. Are you hearing me? When you, when you realize it's not about you, stop being anxious. We're talking about, you know, we're in a recession and, and, and donors are down and people aren't giving. I mean, everybody's feeling it. But can I tell you something? It's not our responsibility. This is God's responsibility. You know what? I'm, I know it sounds crazy. I go to sleep. And some of y'all don't. You're taking all kind of little medications and, and pills and, and staying up watching infomercials at 3 in the morning and then buying the stuff you already broke. How are you going to buy that stuff that's on at 3 in the morning? That's designed for people crazy like you. <laughs> if it was that good, why ain't it on at 3 in the afternoon? Hello? <laughs> Be anxious about nothing. I don't care what it is. One of the ways to rejoice in the present is to release anxiety. This thing ain't about us it's about God and if God calls you he will supply and sustain you some of y'all came to this conference on your last leg and you know what's so funny listen 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 some of us have become experts in pretending like we all right and some of y'all in this room you have fooled everybody how you doing oh praise God I'm blessed of the Lord how are you 
Hey, man, isn't this a great, oh, what a conference. What a conference. And if we could have the bubble over your head that's saying what you really think, I ain't got enough money for lunch. I, I don't even know how I'm going to make it. I'm about to get fired when I get back or fire somebody. I, don't look at me in that tone of voice. You know I'm telling the truth. There's some pain in the room. There's some suffering in the room. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Rejoice. I came to tell you, rejoice, 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 rejoice. You can be flat broke and you can be rejoicing. Your staff could be cut in half, but you can be rejoice. Your donor list may have gone from 20 to 1. Oh, but you can still rejoice because in everything by prayer and supplication, I make my requests made known unto the one that can change the situation. I'm not going to talk to folk who can't change it, but if I can pray, the God of the universe is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all I ask or think. And so, Paul concludes. In the seven minutes I have left, verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever is right, whatever's just, Whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, you want to know how to rejoice in the present? Get your mind off of stuff that you ain't had no business having your mind on in the first place. Whatsoever things are lovely and pure and of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, then focus your attention on those things. Why don't you look at the life that God has used you to be a vehicle to help change? Is there a story that you can point to of a family that was hopeless, but because of your own broken messed up life, God used it. And now that family has been redeemed by the grace of God. Can you think about how good God has been? Do you realize how God has met your needs? Do you, real, do you know that you should be cuckoo for cocoa puffs? Listen, do you know, listen y'all, listen, listen, no, 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 no. See, see, people don't know how close people are to going crazy. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend, cause see, some of y'all really need to stop acting. All oh, I'm, I'm a Christian uh, uh, leader. Just stop it. You, you know, you have been on the brink, and folk don't know that some of y'all got some past, and it didn't take but a moment to go back a little bit. And they ought to thank God that the Holy Ghost kept you from going where you really wanted to go. You had some folk in your ministry came to you with nothing and you helped them along. And now they had the nerve to not talk about you. And you from the ghetto, they don't know it. It ain't nothing but the Holy Ghost that kept you from going off. What happens 
when you start learning to cast all your cares on God and to make these requests made known unto him because he's the only one that can address it because he's the one that keeps us. He's the one that keeps our mind. He's the one that makes us not quit when we want to. Some of you all have come to this conference and you are part of a ministry and you have already written your resignation letter but have not pushed the send button yet. Because you're tired! And then you get these celebrities that join the team. Keep looking at me, won't nobody know we're talking about you and your little team. But then you get the celebrity that has joined your team that gets all of the credit. Oh, we're so glad to have you here. Let's listen to so-and-so. And you're like, yeah, I'm the one doing everything. I'm the one buying the hot dog buns. I'm the one driving the kids all the way home. Won't you let the celebrity drive the kids home? And you got to sit here at the conference with the celebrity. <laughs> y'all know I'm telling the truth. Y'all, being a part of a Christian ministry is tough. You know why? Because you're a part of it. Aha! Aha! Uh -huh. You thought I was going to talk about the crazy one. You, you. You ain't perfect yourself. You show up late to stuff, and you show up unprepared, and you want grace extended to you that you won't extend to nobody else. Your team asked you to do something at this conference so they can actually give an accountability record for why we sent as many of y'all here and you feel like, well, why I gotta give a report? I... Maybe you should learn that God is calling you to be the difference that you're looking for and not for someone else to be the difference that you're looking for. So he just finally admonishes us in these last words. Hey, listen, if there's anything good, think on that. And then he says in verse 9, here it is. Whatever you've learned or received or heard or seen, put it into practice. And then he says this. And when you do that, the peace of God will be with you. He says, if you've heard anything, if you've experienced anything, if you've seen anything, then guess what? Do something with it. As we leave this place, you all listen. It's another conference, and to God be the glory. But you know how many binders you have? It's unreal how many binders you have. Imagine doing something in a binder. Imagine actually doing something you learned in a workshop. Imagine actually putting into practice something that God has dropped in your spirit. So as I take my seat in the last 50 seconds that I have, I came to remind you, rejoice in the Lord, even though it's difficult, even though it's tough, even though you're lonely. Rejoice! 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 Is there anybody here that loves Jesus? Is there anybody here that loves the Lord? Then give God the best praise! You can do better than that! You can do better than that! He's worthy! He's worthy! He's worthy of all the glory! He's worthy of all the honor! Come on, give God one more praise.